So hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews for Hospital Radio Reading and for my YouTube channel. And I'm super excited that my guest today is the fantastically talented Tony Way. Thank you, Tony, for joining me. How are you? Very good. And you're very welcome. Um, I'm happy to be here. Now, obviously, the last couple of years have been tough for a lot of people. They've been a very strange sort of time to, to be living in. How have you found it all? How have you been coping with the kind of the new way of the world, you know, the way, we, the way that things are? Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky one for me because we, um, me and my partner, that is, had a very different time anyway because we had a baby literally at the very beginning of lockdown one. So... It was like the end of March, so it just started. So it's been weird anyway because we've had a, we've got a baby in the house, or now a toddler. So it's hard to tell what was different from the lockdown and the pandemic, and what was different just becoming parents. Um, I mean, what was hard was definitely you know huge chunks of her very short life so far. Uh, she's not been allowed to see anyone other than us, um, which has been great because we've been at home but also probably tough like on my parents and stuff like that and aunts and uncles and people that want to see her friends. So uh, yeah, it's been a weird one for us. Um, I mean, I, I imagine yeah. it must be strange as well because obviously, you know, it, you know, becoming parents and, and, and going through that whole situation and then not being able to kind of lean on people and, and go to people and, and kind of have that. Cause you know, obviously the, the, you know, the sort of the early years of, of, of having a toddler, there's, you know, there's groups that you'd normally go to. There's, there's, you know, classes and, and things you would do to kind of get them out there. Sure. I mean, there was, literally no um there wasn't really any anything happening there were the sort of the, all of that usual stuff even the really early stuff like the um the nurses you'd normally see a lot more were were done and then they were slowly phased into zoom and healthcare visitors that sort of thing um all became online to be honest once again it's a mixed blessing because a lot of those groups you, i personally want to avoid anyway but that, yeah it's weird I mean, we don't know but we didn't know any different if we'd had another child before that maybe we would have um compared it a bit more but we didn't know really so it, it, i think it's worked out she seems okay <laughs> <laughs> and i mean that's the thing as well that you know going forward it, it, the, the nhs have obviously always been amazing and i suppose that's the other thing is that you've kind of sort of been obviously relying on the nhs but not for you know the same reasons as other people obviously with you know covid and everything so i mm. imagine for you it must be nice to know that you know they've still been working hard in other areas as well as as covid i mean absolutely and when when without going to too much grisly detail of it all but it really was the start of the bad bit of the pandemic the first lockdown when we were in and you could see that people were tense the the nurses were tense the doctors were tense and this is in you know in the maternity ward they were nowhere near the covid ward but the staff were dropping like this is before it's even been reported all of this stuff the staff were dropping up like, if you people forget there was no testing then we got tested and it took two days to come back in a hospital you know there was no lateral flow there was it was you could feel the tension they didn't know what was going to happen and th there was this i think we forget how scary it actually was it still is really but at least we know a bit more about it now but at the time it was terrifying you could when doctors and nurses look look tired and scared it, it's scary they did an amazing job um uh, but you could tell the strain was there that early on uh, it, it didn't take long it, it was and they were doing an amazing job um to get through it all you know just just the staff being ill themselves alone was was clearly killing them you know it was it was hard bad choice of words but I mean, as I was going to say, you, you couldn't really put it any better because, I mean, obviously they, they were, it was alien to them as well. And kind of when the people you rely on and you lean to for advice and for help, they don't know what's going on either. And it is, a, you know, a scary time and, and no one knew what was going to happen next. I think people genuinely forget that as well. They think about the way it is now and sort of re retrofit that to what, and they sort of say, oh, it was all right. You could have done this. You could have done that. No, no, you forget how bad it was and how scary it was um uh yeah I, in that thing of people saying learn to live with it which i think is a tricky thing it can be but we sort of have because we <laughs> you know we don't think about it the same way we kind of are sort of learning to live with it that can seem callous and there's a bad way of learning to live with it too which is just to ignore it, which is madness but you know what i mean we've, we've sort of 
um, we worked our way around a lot of things, I think. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, when you were kind of getting, you know, kind of easing yourself back into work after after fatherhood, was was that a strange time for you? I mean, how were you affected work wise? Well, uh, my our industry shut down completely. No one knew what was going on. That's an insurance thing, I think, more than anything. A bit boring, but I think that's what it is. Everything at the end of the day is about insurance. And if you can't insure something, you can't do it. You can't drive. You can't do that. So you can't make a film or a TV show. Um, once that started getting sorted out, things started. Things that have been mothballed and things that have been frozen started going again. Um, but I didn't work for ages. None of us did, um, which was fine by me. I basically had paternity for ages. But then I did, I always knew I had afterlife to go on to do. That was always scheduled for the next year, next, the next spring. So I kind of had that on the horizon, whatever happened. I knew that was going to happen, even if you got moved around or pushed. That was nice. So I got to enjoy being a dad. I also got to be terrified and locked in my house as well, <laughs> like everyone else. But there was stuff, things popped up here and there, you know, um, and suddenly it actually got very busy, weirdly. There were, pockets where lockdowns were lifted insurance was sorted everything would film suddenly it would go mad and i think there's a lot of companies a lot of places could look to the film and tv industry for how to be covid secure because it was so well done so quickly everyone tested everyone separate everyone in different cars um cohorts uh, everything separated in the way that the, the hospitals do it um it was amazing and i think you could look to it because at the end of the day they knew if one or two people got it that's everyone's job it's not like they just get sent home everyone's then at risk especially early on so it was amazing the way they did it but i filmed up in manchester a bit i filmed here and there uh towards lockdown two i guess it would have been the, the christmas one um and uh, it was great i never got it i've still not got got it and i've worked a fair bit so yeah they, they're doing great stuff in film and tv i mean obviously when afterlife uh, you know started filming uh, you know obviously the, for the third series i mean i imagine that obviously uh, you, you there must have been kind of nerves about going back not knowing what to expect but, but i mean obviously you know clearly it was done really well i mean how, how what, what sort of things were you finding had been put in place to make sure everyone was safe what sort of things were you kind of having to do to to keep everyone uh, in in a safe position well, i had um i had worked a bit i did a bit on cobra for sky and also for sky been in britannia for an episode a couple of guest episodes and so i knew and i've done a few other bits here and there as well and so i knew the kind of thing that was being put into place it was less hardcore than that because it was a bit further down the line like cobra was filming in the middle of proper lockdown you know and, and it was in manchester which was at the highest tier and remember tears that yeah yeah that. <laughs> um so it was full on and it was the only thing you could try to do was travel was for work and I had a bit of a sort of thought about is this essential work, but I was I was a good boy. It was travel tested at home, PCR tested at home. This is all very expensive, obviously. Traveled on, you know, all of the trains were very empty. In a hotel, uh, self um, catering hotel, there was no catering in the hotels. I was there for three days early so that the PCR test could come in. Tested the very next, the very that first day of filming um masks all of the time everyone's always tested on on sets um anyway all of that stuff um and that was so that was all still there by the time afterlife came around but it wasn't new now so crews crews work all of the time the sound camera art all of that lot they get very used to new protocols very quickly actors don't work as much we come in and out so you turn up and they are all they're all in masks all the time they're used to it they just do it they know what they're doing bring your own cutlery bring your own drinks containers that sort of thing um you don't have to queue for your lunch anymore that's all <laughs> we that's all laid out in boxes now it's the little things like that that they're all they have covid supervisors now if you look at the end of a tv show or a film where it used to just be it used to go sort of stunt department drivers it now goes stunt department covid um covid team and then drivers you know it's kind of <laughs> mad there's a whole it's, it's weird there's a hind, industry there that sort of always there's money everywhere but it's sort of needed um and it, it works i mean it, it not it's not in, it's not completely perfect they, people do still get 
it. You can't control what everyone does outside of work. And, you know, especially with Omicron and, and these the newer variants, they're kind of very uh, popular. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're quite... Um, they're quite good at getting through all of your defenses in the end. But um, it felt like a while, about a month ago, everyone I knew had Omicron. Um, but yeah, no, so lots, lots of stuff. It's a very different way of filming, but everyone's got very used to it very quickly. I mean, one thing I know that Ricky said um, uh, in an interview, and I think, um, you know, it, it really was an important thing to say, was that, you know, obviously he didn't want to heavily reference, you know, COVID during the, the final series, because obviously this series, hope, you know, it's been so popular and will, people will continue to watch this for years to come. And they don't want to be constantly reminded of, oh, yeah, that happened in, in, in the COVID times. So I think yeah. that, that was amazing that you guys were able to make it work and it didn't have to look, you know, you couldn't tell that it was filmed during COVID. No, it was uh, also, Ricky, I think if there's a good joke to be made or a good point to be made, he'll do it. But referencing it for the sake of it and us all wearing masks would seem weird. Also, he doesn't, he likes things to remain sort of timeless. I mean, there's, there are things you can point, obviously there will be things you can point to that would date it, but he wants something, someone to watch in 20 years time and not, I think oh that's a covid show you know it's or it's all about that it would be weird if it was suddenly about it is referenced um there's a good joke about it but it's very fleeting um also we were all sick of talking about it personally like we we were already sitting in a rehearsal room in masks sitting you know two meters away from each other the last thing we want to do is now go and do a load of stuff about it so um yeah it, it, i don't think people seem fussed about it it was a talk it's talked about though literally every every show that's set now that's a sort of contemporary show everyone i think went through that kind of thing there's a there's a, there's, there's all these mentions of people in cobra which i did recently i was watching it back um and there's they, they did it quite well because that's about this sort of thing i watched the first series of cobra um as the first lockdown started so it was like really oddly like life imitating art um and in this one they do sort of mention people dying and things like that and people being sick but they don't it's not that's not the plot it's not the plot at all it's about cyber um but it's that's quite a clever way of doing it they kind of go oh my granddad died and this happened or something i got ill without referencing it specifically um it's a tricky one but there, there's loads of great stuff out there that is just all about it as well which is has to there has to be has to be recorded has to be you know you can't ignore it can you <laughs> <laughs> now i wanted to take you back to where it all began i mean with afterlife do you remember when the concept for the show was first brought to you do you remember what your thoughts were of this show did did you think it would go on to be as popular as it has become um the first thing i heard about it um i got a call out of the blue from ricky um and i know ricky a bit you know through through the years i've been on a on extras and and I've, I've known he's you know it's a small world the comedy world you all bump into each other but it's not like we we would regularly call each other or even text each other so it was a bit surprising he called me this was a good year i think before we started working on afterlife proper he just sort of said, oh, I'm writing, got a sitcom I'm writing, Netflix. I might not have even said it was Netflix at the time. Uh, it's part for you in it, uh, potentially, if you want to do it. I was like, yeah, I think I might. Um, and he said, um, bloke's about to kill himself. I'm like, right, <laughs> this is not the usual openings of a sitcom. And then he doesn't because he sees his dog needs feeding. And that means he lives for another day. And then he went into the, the, the other higher concept bit of the idea which is he then decides if he's going to stay alive gonna you know act exactly how he wants and tell people what he thinks of them etc etc the superpower bit of it so that was a good year before the ball really got rolling i think it was a while um and then there were meetings lots of meetings between then and filming where we talk about character and lots of uh meetings where we bounce ideas off of us me and, uh, and tom and diane and and everyone um i felt like i got to a good few of those as well it was really nice to see it growing and then we started filming i mean there was a part <laughs> where i first went into it have a face-to-face -face meeting with him about afterlife and i went to his office uh in Hampstead, and his his assistant came down to 
get me. It's, it's by the front of a shop you go in through the side. And I won't give it away exactly where it is. <laughs> um, but you go up some stairs, and there's a, quite a lot of stairs. It's around the back, up some stairs. I got so I was exhausted. I was like, oh, crap. Thank God we're in, the, in his office now. We open the door, and I saw he wasn't in the office bit there. He has a mezzanine. There was another set of stairs. And I, I went, oh, not more stairs. And I didn't know because I didn't know he was in the room and I heard heard his voice ah, laughing and he was on the mezzanine bit and he went, that's it. Now you've got, that's it. That, well, that's going in the script. You've got the part. So if there's any doubt that it was written for me, that sort of <laughs> me not wanting to go up another flight of stairs, even though it could be a life changing job, sort of uh, sealed the deal there. Um, but I had no, to finish the last bit of your question, I had no idea how big it was going to be. I know that Ricky has a following and I knew it would, the people that, you know, like Ricky's stuff, were going to be on board. And it was Netflix, but I'd sort of forgotten that when something goes out on Netflix, that day, it's in 120 countries. It's it's everywhere. Um, I think even Ricky, I, we all were blown away. Couldn't Cannot believe how popular it is. Um, proper stopped in the street by every type of person, every age of person. It's mad, actually. It's mad, and and it's not not all of them are saying the same thing either. There's people that have sort of been bereaved and recently, and saying it, it helped me, which is sort of you know bloody hell, it's amazing. And there's other people that just shout really rude things at you, funny things. <laughs> <laughs> the, the script, I mean, that, you know? that's the great thing with the show is, like you say, it's reached so many people. But it, unlike a lot of programs where you know people watch it, they enjoy it, and then they move on people really have taken this show to their hearts. And like you say, people, it has changed people's lives. It must be such an honor to be a, be a part of that and to kind of know that you've, you've played a small part in helping people. At the beginning, it was slightly overwhelming. I, I've never been in anything. I've been in some popular stuff in smaller and bigger parts, but I've never, I was blown away by how the outpouring. Um, but yeah, like the more you get used to that and the more you hear people's stories and you see... I mean, Twitter's insane at the moment, like with people just wanting to say how it's touched them and, and, and how it made them laugh, and made them cry, uh, and both. Um, it is extraordinary, and it is. It's, it's a bit of an honour, actually, and it's, it's, um, it's overwhelming, really. But I got used to it, you know, now I just want everyone to tell me how great I am. All the time. <laughs> That's my thing. Uh, no, it's mad. It's, it's brilliant. I love it. And I hope, I, I, I think Ricky always wanted to get those topics out there, and I, and I, I think he has, and in a, in a way, in a, in a much better way than we ever could have imagined. Yeah. I mean, obviously Lenny is a great character, but I mean, for you, what is it that you loved most about playing Lenny and, and what will you miss about playing Lenny? I like, um, I like, there's a lot left unsaid with Lenny. I've spoken to Ricky about this before and I've, I've said to him, I, I don't mind not having lines if you don't want to give me them. Cause I, I'll, I'll just look and react and I quite like someone said it the other day and it's true it's, he's a he's a photographer so he's he's um I don't know how good a photographer he is but his natural state is to sit back and watch and record and um but it also means when you get the funnier lines or the odd things they hit harder because <laughs> he's been so quiet the rest of the time I mean he does have lines he's not mute but especially in those interview scenes he's not his job so he sits back and he can take it all in he can take in what's happening with ricky's character and the people they're interviewing and everything so it's i like that bit i like the fact that he can be slightly removed sometimes from the scene and sort of watch it but it makes it even more effective when he's in the heart of the scene and he, he's being a being an idiot <laughs> <laughs> or when he's being called an idiot <laughs> i mean i say one of the kind of most i would say one of the the kind of most sort of yeah, what's the best way of describing it i suppose that the kind of the scene that caused um people to really like be quite surprised obviously in the later series without giving too much away um is obviously the scene where ricky just has a complete mad outburst to the father of a little kid um yes. That must be strange when you're recording that because obviously Ricky is talking to your stomach in a sense. <laughs> yes. I mean, also, you can't fake that. He just did it. That's the sort of thing you forget about when you're rehearsing or writing it, I guess. Um, is at some point that's going to happen and it's going to happen quite a lot of times because you're corpse and you've got other shots to do and you've got to do it from different angles. Um, I've got a little bit used to 
being having to do weird things for TV and film. I've done a lot of them. That's far, 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 far from the weirdest. I'll say <laughs> it's it's very low down on the list. I've done some much <laughs> odder stuff than that before. I mean, I felt I, to be honest. I think I got the better end of the deal there. I think the person who's doing the blow, blowing the raspberry, let's just say, people are not going to know if you've not seen it. You're not going <laughs> to have these pictures. But the person blowing the raspberry. I think has the worst deal than the person who receives it. Um, he complained I had aftershave on. It was actually deodorant. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I don't aftershave my, my tummy. <laughs> I mean, the funny you thing need is, a lot of it. You need a lot of aftershave if you are. Okay. <laughs> I mean, to say the funny thing is, you could have said, obviously, he wrote it, so he obviously has to uh, to, to live with the consequences. Absolutely, that's <laughs> quite right. Yes, yeah. he's actually quite kind. He doesn't really make you do anything too bad. Poor Ethan who plays my not son, not my son. He had a couple of stinkers, it's just, but they're very funny. But he, he ends up showing a lot more flesh than I've had to in afterlife. But you have to do these things. To, it's funny. It is funny. I mean, one thing I would strongly recommend if anyone hasn't done so already is on YouTube, there are clips of kind of the outtakes from both, I think, season two and season three. Um, and season for, one, I think. And well. season yeah. one, yeah. yeah. For you, when those happen, those moments happen, and Ricky just, you know, falls into fits of laughter, what is that like for you guys on set? Because I imagine it is hard to then go again. <laughs> I just go with it now. I don't even pretend to be a professional. I'm laughing pretty much all of the time. Um, I, I don't have a very good poker face. I'm, I'm a corpse at the best of times. Um, it shows you how relaxed the set is, I think, though, that we all know we can do it and then get on with it. Sometimes it goes too far. <laughs> you literally don't get it. You think, we're never going to get this done. This is insane. But um, I, I quite like it. We kind of get into this sort of weird state of hysteria that we sort of have to get into of not getting it right and laughing. And and then it seems to, we do a good take. I don't know. It's odd. I don't know how it works. It's a sort of weird voodoo. And despite all of those retakes, we still finish. It's the earliest you ever finish on any job is when you work with Ricky. So he's doing something right. We managed to, feels like we waste loads of time, but actually we're not. It's, it's an odd one, but it's fun. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, the other great thing about, obviously, Afterlife is that you've done other projects with, you know, your, your other co-stars. I mean, obviously, you recently appeared in Mandy um, yeah. alongside Diane Morgan. What was that like to do? And, and to obviously play a Russian was a bit interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mandy was great. Um, I love Diane. Like, but everyone's, everyone on Afterlife, I think, pretty much could go out for a pint with each other. We're all kind of friends anyway. You know, it's, it's good. I, I always like it when you work with people again and it was i was really sort of pleased that, that i was asked by diane to come and do that and um she mentioned a russian i said i can do russian yeah i can i can't speak russian although i do in that i just i can do it it's one of my it's one of my few like i can i know i can do that accent other accents i can do with a bit of practice or you know russian's one of my russian and welsh i can do those with <laughs> a lot um but yeah, no, Mandy's a laugh to do. It's really good fun. And it's like half the cast is actually the afterlife cast, <laughs> if you watch through. Michelle was, as, plays her friend and Tom's in it. And uh, I think Joe's in the new series as well, Joe Hartley. Everyone comes across <laughs> from it. Kate Robbins is in both. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the thing is, obviously, you've done so many amazing shows. I mean, obviously, people might forget. You've done things like Game of Thrones, stuff like that. For you, do you remember what, what job it was that maybe, you, you know, was when you first realised that you were, you know, well-known, people knew who you were and would approach you? Do you remember kind of where that, where that started for you? Um, it's a weird one. There's different types of being known. So long, long time ago, I was in the LEG film. So for a certain age of person, that is a, what I was known for. I was still lived uh, back in my hometown of Essex because i was quite young that wasn't actually fun because <laughs> there were loads of other teenagers just going oh yeah, yeah you're martin freeman all these other things and doing my voice in it like, oh. actually it wasn't that fun that was my first taste of ah, oh, right it's not all great being in films and telly but i tell you what the, what, the uh, game of thrones fans are amazing They're, that was a big one once you're in that they're quite dedicated and 
Um, I suppose Game of Thrones. It's weird. I still, my Twitter handle is, my Twitter name is Tony Way Bloke off the telly. And it is a bit like that. Still, even with Afterlife, people go, oh, you. Uh, who are you? I know you. Oh, you're in. And the reason that is because I'm in loads of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Two loads of different bits. I'd love, a, I'd love to do a guest part. So they kind of go, oh, I know. But it's because the reason they can't quite get it is because they've probably seen me in everything. I'm, I'm, I'm not not choosy. I do try and choose good <laughs> stuff, but I'm not, I'm not very quick to say no. I do like to consider every option. <laughs> so I think that's it. Um, so I have an odd. For, loads of people recognise me all of the time. I never notice it. I think I've just got, I don't know, bad peripheral vision or something. My <laughs> girlfriend sees it. My girlfriend walking beside me sees. Ah, they've all. You must have been on TV last night. Ever? Yeah, it's an odd one. I'm I mean, happy to talk to everyone. I talk to them all. I, I, I'm, I, I like a chat. I talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there going forward? Is there a dream role? Something you haven't done that you would love to do if, if given the opportunity? Um, I'd love to do a big sci-fi. I did do Edge of Tomorrow, but I'd like to do something. There's a lot of good sci-fi TV now. Um, I think of the Star Wars shows that sort of thing i'd love to do one of those if anything just so i can do more convention circuits after it, because that's good fun but yeah i did i did do a bit in a star wars but it was cut out along with it half of the um half of the british comedy actors alive today were all in either left in or cut out of that um so i don't feel bad there were loads of us on the cutting room floor um so i'd love to do something like that actually that would be good fun a little run at something sci-fi but the fun stuff like the fun stuff at the moment it can get a bit um serious especially a lot of the later star wars can get a bit or the middle star wars got a bit serious i'd love to do something mandalorian -y or because they, they have lots of sort of comedy people turning up in that i could i don't know if they film in this country i have to go to america as well which would be lovely <laughs> for a holiday and i mean the other thing we have to ask of course if there was ever the chance for you to revisit lenny in afterlife would you go back would you want to do if, if he was offered a spin-off you know would you would you want to go back to that character again i think i think the only person that's not doesn't want to go back and do it is ricky and i think he's regretting his decision to be honest with you it's it's been such a great reaction that oh absolutely i love doing it i'd do 10 series of afterlife i don't think it would i don't know if it would still be as good it, i doubt it would be i mean ricky's probably right he probably knows when it, the story's over but Ricky said, like, if any of us come up with a decent idea, we'll go, you can go off and do it. Just give him 50%, which I'm up for. But there's so many potential spin-offs from Afterlife. It's like the cast of The Simpsons there now. It's got huge. But yes, so, or I'd, I'd love to go back and do a Christmas special. And I mention it every time I speak to Ricky. We'll, we'll definitely wear him away one day. <laughs> <laughs> we have our fingers away. crossed because we would love yeah, to yeah. see that. Let's I mean, start the hashtag was it a, a petition now on Twitter. I mean, that's the thing is that I think like a lot of, um, you know, really popular shows, they often only had a short run. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, um, for example, 40 Towers, for example, mm -hmm. only had, I think, 12 episodes. And I mean, yeah. I think part of keeping people wanting more is a great thing because the, the the worst thing you can do is you know flog a dead horse for for years and people go, well, is that yeah. still on on telly? Yeah, yeah. You don't want to outstay your welcome. I get it. Um, it's. I think I would agree with him more if we didn't have such a good time on it, but we do. So I'd I just like selfishly would want to go back and do more for that. I mean, it's it's it, to keep it as authored as Ricky does. Him being the author, you know. You can't keep going. I don't think you can keep going on with that forever. In America, they I know they go on for 22. Ricky said this the other day, three series. We still haven't got a whole American primetime series out of that. They'd be on episode 22, a, se a season. We've not reached that and we've finished the whole program. You know, it's, um, it's hard work for one person to write that much comedy. And it's so heartfelt and personal. So the only way you really could keep it going on and on is to get a team in. And is it the same then? I don't know. They seem to do it all right in America. It's just a different system. We don't seem to do that. Also, they've got a lot more money. We don't want to split our money up between loads of different writers. We want to keep it all for ourselves. I mean, that's the thing is, obviously, Ricky is such a talented writer. I mean, what, I mean, that's one question I suppose I should ask is, what, what was your involvement? Did, do you kind of get any say over what your character might do or say? 
or do you kind of feel like you don't want to mess with Ricky's writing? Um, we definitely do, without a doubt. And there's some characters there who come in and do what they want within reason. Like they, they, like um, they're sort of placeholder scenes for them. Lenny, not so much. I can't. Yeah, I've come up with jokes for him, and Ricky's come up with them on the fly. And there's looks, looks here and bits there that are changed. But a lot of that happens in rehearsal as well. But there are people like when Colin Holt comes in, um, uh, or when uh, when David L comes in as Brian Gittings, you don't really, you kind of know what's going, on, but you don't really know what's going to happen. And uh, and when Ratty and the Nonce come in, it's like you've been raided by Vikings. It's like what are they? You have no idea what they're going to say next, and it, it's fun. It's really good fun that. I mean, referring, um, I was going to say, referring back to obviously the outtakes, I mean, we can't mm. mention half the words that were said, mm. but some of the things, I mean, were those, were those all made up on the spot or was that, was that sort of scripted? Uh, no, it's a bit, a bit of both. Yeah. I think it's accepted with a couple of characters like those, those four I just mentioned and a couple of other people too. It's kind of expected that, right, here's the script. It's a, it's a starting, it's a jumping off point. Let's see what happens. And and especially with um, Tom and Andy, who play Ratty and, and the, I shouldn't even say the, that word. Um, they, it's like the challenge is accepted and they come in and they are amazing. Because they've worked together so much on Phone Shop as a, as a proper double act on that. It's extraordinary watching them. And you see them walking out going, like, I'll say that, you say this. And then they come in and they're just, ah. It's genuinely, this series in a row, I think it was in one day, uh, I might be slightly wrong, but I think in one day we had Brian Gittings coming in, we had Colin Holt coming in, and then uh, that pair. Those scenes were back to back, and I, I was just sat there, like basically like in this chair now. It was like I had a masterclass in <laughs> kind of comedy and abuse, and just, it was amazing. I was in pain, I <laughs> laughed so much. I don't know, nope. and you've got to try and keep a straight face for at least a minute. <laughs> now, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Before we go, though, is there any messages you'd like to give to the people who are currently stuck in hospital at the moment? Anything you'd like to say to them? Oh, obviously, get well soon. And um, I hope this <laughs> me waffling on has helped you feel a bit better for the day. Get well soon. Um, what do you play records? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can definitely play Request song. some songs. It's always good to request a song. It's fine playing things on your on your on your mobile devices but it's always good to get a dj to play a song request some songs <laughs> <laughs> now i just want to say thank you so much for giving out your time it's been an absolute pleasure of course keep safe and you are welcome back anytime oh i'd love to come back well uh, you're very welcome i've had a lovely chat thank you <laughs>